<laughs> All right. We're going to uh, we're going to get started here, and uh, welcome. Glad you're here for Bible study tonight. And um, we have uh, some people on Zoom. We have people on Facebook. Uh, everybody's watching different ways. Um, we're on the same uh, wavelength as the uh, school system. So when the school system is closed for inclement weather, we're closed as well. So uh, we didn't do our fitness class or celebration dinner tonight, but we are doing Bible study. Uh, before I start, let me uh, make sure that you guys know, I sent out a thing that had a couple of prayer requests on it, but I did not include Doug Cummings' mother-in-law who uh, had, um, she, you know, she was supposed to have so shoulder surgery. She fell, broke her shoulder, and they're not doing the surgery now. They're waiting for it to heal. But she also has the flu, and then they have just, uh, if, I'm, if I heard Jenny correctly, um, they are taking her into surgery today, that this evening, to um, for a perforation in her intestines. I think is that what it was, Jenny? Yeah, yes. just making but sure. It's, it's Doug's stepmother. Doug's stepmother. Time. Sorry, yeah, yeah Doug's stepmother, Marsha, that yes. we were praying for last week. So remember her. Uh, in addition to the ones that were already on there for um, the the email that I sent out. All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we ask you to join us and that you would lead us tonight, that you would explain the Bible to us. Uh, Lord, let it change us and transform us and let it motivate us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So um, we are going to be in several places, but we're going to pick back up where we've been most of the time, which is in uh, First and Second Kings and um, First and Second Chronicles. And so... We, we've been talking about Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat just basically, um, when he passes away, you have another king that comes in, and he is going to, after all is said and done, uh, you know, Jehoshaphat followed his father uh, Asa and did what Asa had taught him to do. Well, jo Jehoshaphat's sons do not, and so uh, we want to make sure um, it's in... Second Chronicles 21. Let's go there, not Kings. I'm sorry. They both tell the same story, but uh, I want us to make sure that... It's, so it's Second Chronicles 21. And the question is always, um, how do we make our choices? Uh, you know, what kinds of things? Because we've been talking about this both on Wednesday night and on Sundays about, um, you know... If we're going to make a choice, what process do we go through or do we just do um, whatever to, um, we're making sure to admit everybody that's trying to get on uh, uh, on Facebook and Zoom. All right, so uh, here in chapter 21 it says, Then Jehoshaphat rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. And Jehoram, or Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azarahu, Michael, and Shephtiah. And all these were sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father had given them many gifts of silver and gold and articles of value, as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was his firstborn son. So that's the process by what he was doing to, to see who was going to succeed him. And it says, when Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all of his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He followed the ways of the king of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for he married a daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with David, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. Um, so we're looking there and we're trying to piece together why certain bad things start happening in Israel. Remember, Israel's in the north, um, Judah is in the south. It's split after Solomon died. And so you have this uh, northern kingdom, southern kingdom thing going on. You have two kings and Jehoshaphat was king in the south in Judah. And now his son Jehoram is taken over for him. And he went and the first thing he did was to kill off all of his brothers. So there was nobody that could usurp the throne. No one that could take over for him uh, and push him out of the way. There was nobody to perform a coup or whatever. And when it comes to politics, 
this is a normal thing at times in countries is to do away with your enemies so that they don't have a chance to take over for you or to do something like that. For us, we go, this is horrific. He killed all of his brothers. Um, and, and yet it solidified his kingdom per se, but it didn't. That was the intent, um, but it didn't. And then the next thing he did was he went and married one of, the, one of Ahab. Ahab was the king of the north while Jehoshaphat was king. And so Jehoram married one of Ahab's daughters. And remember, Solomon got in trouble for doing this because it was a, it was a practice that went on worldwide that if you made an agreement or an alliance with another country, you took one of that king's daughters as a wife. You were given a wife as some kind of like bargaining chip, as some kind of you know spoil that went along with this, this treaty that, that you had just made. And so it's, it's good alliance between, good, good business between the north and the south here in Israel. And so he marries this woman. The problem with that is, is that Ahab was into witchcraft. His wife had carried him to that spot. Um, and that is actually, um, you remember we talked about Jezebel and what a negative connotation that name has. And she was from Tyre and Sidon and her family worshiped other gods and they did all kinds of evil, terrible things. And in fact, she's the one that encouraged her husband um, to, and her husband was Ahab, encouraged him, uh, and she had Naboth killed so that they could take Naboth's vineyard and that he would have a, Ahab would have a place for his vegetable garden. So this is what goes around, comes around, is getting ready to happen. But here you see two distinct choices that he made that sends his life down a spiral, like down the, the, the swirling toilet. And so for us, we have to be careful about how we make decisions and let, let's kind of put it in perspective for a second. Now, uh, we have to make hard and difficult decisions in our lives. And how do we go about doing that? Okay, so, um, and, and how do those things affect us? So we had a gentleman in our church in, um, at Tusculum, and he had gotten to be about 92 years old, and he couldn't see at all. And he had a, a disabled daughter who lived with him, and they had... Um, some caregivers that would come that were part of medical team and that kind of stuff to kind of watch over them. But the church really watched over them uh, as far as food and clothing, taking them to where they needed to go kind of thing. Um, but this man, this elderly gentleman, was determined that he was going to drive himself anywhere he needed to go. And over the course of uh, the last year of his, you know, of his 92nd year, he uh, would go to the doctor. And when he went to the doctor... He would run into cars with his car. He would scrape other vehicles. He would get in fender benders, and he wouldn't stop. He would just keep going. And um, so it came to the point to where the police came to his house, and they called the pastor of the church I was at, and, and he went over there, and he said, hey, you're going to go with me, because I was the associate. And we went over there, and the police said, you know, we're talking outside, and they said, you, somebody has to take his keys. We can't let him drive anymore. Um, we can take his keys. We can impound his car, all those things, or you can take his keys because he has no extended family um, except for the daughter. And so um, who was, uh, you know, not able to, to care for herself at all. Um, and so we got the elders together. We went over and visited him. We explained to him what was going on and why this was necessary and one of the elders had taken both sets of his keys that were by the door regularly and had gone outside with them. And we explained to him that we had to take his keys. And he just went ballistic. He was really angry, really upset and told us all to get out. And he would never be back to that church again and give him back his keys and all of that. And the officer was still there. The officer explained what was going on and why it was going on, that he was not going to be able to drive any longer and that... The church was his family and friends, and they cared about him, loved him, and didn't want bad things to happen to him. And so they took his keys. And so from that point on, he didn't drive anymore. He, he didn't have the ability to drive anymore. And the church did step up and take him places, um, you know, to make sure that, that that happened and all that. But it was, he, he never came to church again. I mean, never. And uh, so this was a difficult decision, but it was a decision that had to be made. It was a choice that had to be made to make sure that people weren't being hurt, people weren't being injured, Right. Okay, so that's a good example of how we have to do this and how we go through the process of making those choices and decisions. So my friend, uh, he and his wife uh, got married, had been married a few years, and he decided they hadn't had any kids, 
And they were young, like when Jill and I, we, we knew them from the time. They'd been married about a year when we got married. And we were very good friends with them, went to church with them. And they decided that they would buy a dog. And we all have been down this road before. And you have to kind of, you know, we think of that as such a simple choice. Oh, yeah, get a dog. It's no, no big deal. What's, what's, what's wrong with getting a dog? I mean, what's to think about? Just go get it. And actually, he went to this place to go. It was a, it was a family that was selling these dogs. And it was a cute little puppy. And um, uh, he said, what kind of dogs are they? And they, they said, they're pit bulls. And she goes, oh, uh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. And, and they said, oh, it's so cute. We're just going to go ahead and get it. You know, we don't care. It's just little. It's how, how he's trained and all that. You know, it's not, they're not mean dogs kind of thing. And so they took him home and they loved him and trained him and all this. And he got to be one or two years old. And um, so they would keep him in the backyard and he would get through the fence and get away and all this. And so they had to finally, when they would go to work, they decided the best thing for them was to um, uh, put him in the backyard chained up, you know, out there. And so he had this huge, long, uh, you know, chain to, to be able to be on. He had the whole backyard, kind of his run or whatever. And they came home the first day after they had done that, and he had peeled off all of the uh, aluminum siding, that the vinyl siding on the back of their house, up to the point of which he couldn't reach anymore. So like six feet up, he had pulled every piece of vinyl siding off the back of their house, the dog had. And it was all laying there, chewed up into about a million pieces. And of course they came home and they're like, oh, you stupid dog, what are you doing? You're crazy, what are you doing? You know, and that's kind of thing. And so they got upset or whatever. And then he got to where, uh, you know, they shortened up the chain a little bit and he was digging holes. I mean, great big swimming pool size holes in the backyard. And they're like, oh my goodness, you, you dog, I can't believe you're doing this or whatever. And so uh, finally, they, uh, they came home from work at the end of the week, and he had the, they, had tie, they had done the chain around a tree that was probably about this big around in their backyard. Pretty good-sized tree, 30, 40 foot in the air tree. I mean, massive tree. But it was about this big around. They put the chain around it. And they came home, and he had pulled the tree up out of the ground, had dug it out, pulled the tree up out of the ground, and had it leaned up against the fence in their backyard. Now, the choice about whether to get a dog or not seems simple. Seems, and yet, this one had become problematic for them. And every time I would go to their house, I would ring the doorbell, and that dog would come, and they had these little glass windows beside their door, and he would come to the door and press his face right up against the glass, and he'd be like, and you could hear him just growling, and he'd, like he was just going to eat you. And then they'd have to pull him back and they'd get him and they would put him in his cage or whatever and, and get him over there. And, and it was just like, and so this dog just became a problem for them over and over for their whole life about who they were going to leave him with when they went on vacation or would he attack a neighbor or if they had kids, what he would do to their kids. And it just became a problem. And so the choices that we make can be good choices. They can bring, you know, positive things in our life. And then there's choices that we make that can do bad things to us. Now, let's pick up where we left off here and look at uh, what some of the things that happened after those two particular, um, you know, things. And remember, this is a turning from God that, that Jehoram did when he went to worship other gods. He married this woman from Ahab and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord is what it said. But look at uh, verse 8. These are some of the repercussions of why, what happened. In the time of Jehoram, Edom rebelled against Judah and set up its own king. So Jehoram went there with his officers and all his chariots. The Edomites surrounded him and his chariot commanders, but he rose up and broke through by night. But to this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. Libna revolted at the same time because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his ancestors. He had also built high places on the hills of Judah and it had caused the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves and had led Judah astray. Jehoram received a letter from Elijah the prophet, which said, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. You've not allowed the ways of your father Jehosh you have not followed the ways of your father Jehoshaphat or of Asa king of Judah, but you followed the ways of the kings of Israel, and you led Judah and the people of Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, just as the house of Ahab did. You have also murdered your own brothers, members of your own family, men who were better than you. So now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that is yours with a heavy blow. You yourself will be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until the disease causes your bowels to come out. Oh my goodness. 
this is awful. The things that are starting to happen is that two different parts of the kingdom that he ruled over are now in rebellion and, and basically just barely got away with his life from the Edomites. And then now there's Elijah, who is probably one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, if not the greatest. And here he is sending him a letter saying, here, this is what God has decreed for you, and it's not good news. It's terrible news. And he's saying, it's because you've turned from the Lord. You've led the people astray. Um, you pushed people further away from the Lord and got them worshiping other gods. And so he says, you're going you're gonna to have a lingering disease that's painful, and this is how you're going to die. But it continues. Look a little bit further there in 18. I'm sorry, 16. The Lord aroused against Jehoram the hostility of the Philistines and of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. They attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace together with his sons and wives, not a son was left to him except Ahaziah, the youngest. After all this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. In the course of time, at the end of the second year, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he died in great pain. His people made no funeral fire in his honor as they had for his predecessors. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret, and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. He died in great pain and to no one's regret. No one cared that he died. I have been to funerals where there are only two people there. I have been there. I had to preach funerals for folks like that who had no friends or family. And a lot of times it's because they were just so mean, nasty, uh, had so much sin in their life that they just alienated everybody and the punishment was on them for that. There were repercussions and consequences to that. So here we have this story and how Jehoram's life, and it's just choice after choice. He makes bad ones. And so how can we, uh, what can we do? And let's, let's just use a, an example here of, of like work, right? So if we're going to be employed somewhere, if we get a job somewhere, there are some choices that we make and uh, one is, are we going to be at the job? Are we going to work? Uh, because sometimes you have people and they're just out or they leave early or they're late or, you know, they hide when they get there. My home pastor used to say his first job was at a tire plant and his best friend that worked there said, if you'll just go back in the warehouse because it's so enormous and find you a place you can lay down and sleep and be gone for several hours and no one will even know where you are. And then you can just say you were working in the back of the warehouse and you get paid for sleeping. So some folks go and hide. Uh, those, that's a choice is to whether to be there or not. Um, the next one would be whether to work or not. And what I mean by that is sometimes we go to work and we don't do anything. We stand around the water cooler talking. We are always on our phone. We're looking at something on the computer. Um, we're just kind of you know, up and down the hallways working. Um, and we're not really making sales calls if we go out, if we're a salesman. We're just kind of riding around, um, going to the mall, going to the golf course, whatever it might be. And so we have no productivity. Our work is inferior. And you know that kind of choice comes out very quickly. Our bosses know that very quickly, and we're we're kind of dumb if we think they don't. Because if we're supposed to be doing this and producing this, and it's not happening, they know we're screwing up. They know that we're we've made that choice. Um, there's a choice about whether to lie or not at work, to be deceitful. And um, you know when when they ask questions like "Where have you been?", you know, make up something, uh, tell them a lie. Questions like. Um, on your resume, you know, your training, your experience, all those things. Stuff like um, uh, about, you know, you lie about your coworkers or you lie to clients. I was a salesman for two years and the worst thing you can do is lie to your client. The person, your customer that's there, if you're trying to sell them something and they go, can it be here by Friday? And you go, absolutely. And you know it can't be there by Friday. How is that ever going to help you in the long run if you're just lying to the face of the people who are buying some stuff from you? You want them to buy more. That's the whole point is to make a living and so uh, and enjoy it. And lying to them is not in your long-term best interest. It's just not going to increase your sales over time. It's not going to help your company um, nor your relationship with your boss. Okay, another choice, whether to steal from my company or not. Office supplies, right, or equipment. little skimming here and there. Um, whether uh, on my expenses, whether I'm going to cheat or steal on those things, um, whether I'm going to, and, and that's a very short-term concept. 
If we're stealing from our company, they, they're going to find that out. There's cameras in every building. There's computer programs that track that kind of stuff. All of that um, is there. And so, um, you know, it, whether to cheat or not is another one. Whether to have an affair in the office. Whether you see somebody that you like that you work with. Whether to have an affair with them. Um, that ruins your reputation. It ruins your self-esteem because, you know, the everybody starts talking about that. Um, it... Uh, you know, it's a distraction. It hurts your work. Um, plus, it's offensive to your spouse and it's offensive in God's eyes. Um, alcohol and drugs. Those are things they test for. Um, alcohol, again, will rearrange your priorities so that, you know, if I happen to have a drink, it comes before anything else. And, um, you know, when I was at UT, I had a, I was in the business uh, council student, let's see, I can't even remember what it was now. The business students council advisory council business students advisory council I was on and so they would give us advice about what to wear and kind of how to do your hair and what you would say in interviews and all that kind of stuff and then they gave you other kind of like uh, stuff that they thought was important like wine tasting so that you knew a little bit about wine and then they would say things that were just like pieces of advice like if you go to a party a business party um, with clients or whatever drink uh, clear alcohol um, not, uh, I'm sorry, drink dark alcohol, not clear alcohol, because that way they would know you were drunk and not stupid. So um, that's the wise pieces of information that UT was handing out to me back then. Um, so, but, you know, in terms of those choices, whether to do those things on the job, um, those, uh, you know, when we get in our car and we drive under the influence, police officers stop us, they give us a ticket and they say, you can't function well enough right now because of the alcohol to drive this vehicle. So if we're drinking on the job, can we function about how to do an, you know, a sales call or how to do talk to clients on the phone or how to do invoices or accounting work? Aren't we under the influence there as well? So it's going to affect our work just like it affects our car driving. So that's going to be problematic. Um, whether to, uh, I mean, and there's, there's all kinds of these. I mean, I could go on and on. And what you find is, is that you're sitting here trying to say, okay, am I going to sin at work or not? Am I going to do what God says, or am I going to do what the world says is right in terms of business? Um, and there's so many of these, you know, that are there, you know, um, whether to look at pornography at work. We think that's, I mean, for most of us, we would go, duh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Why would I be looking at pornography at work? But uh, I know uh, I have a friend who works for a large plant, a large company, and they put out these emails and texts and announcements on bulletin boards that say, we're going to be checking to see if anybody has pornography on their computers or whether they're looking at pornography on their computers this next week. They're telling them they're coming in the next week. And he goes, we always have to fire four or five people. Because they can't seem to figure that out, that that's not appropriate for work. And so, um, we're, again, it's those choices that we're making. All right, so with all of that being said, using that analogy of work, you know, we're actually putting principles into place that help us at work, or we're putting sins into place that are actually, um, you know, not um, in our best interest, things that harm us. And they're having trouble here with the... Uh, Trying to fix this to try to somebody's trying to get on Zoom a little bit late here. So um, we're actually looking at okay. Let me tell you this story about a guy who worked at a small hotel in uh, Philadelphia, and so he was there. He was the uh, like assistant manager, and he was having to work nights at this hotel downtown Philadelphia, kind of a scummy part of town, but still, you know, it was just a hotel. And so this man and woman, older couple, come in. And they're like, golly, everything's booked. There's no rooms in this whole city. And he goes, oh, yeah, it's a convention for such and such. And, and you know, I'm sorry. And they said, do you have a room? We, we don't have anywhere to stay tonight. We need a room. And he's like, oh. and he's looking at the books and there's no rooms. I mean, none available. Well, one of the perks that he had for his job was that he had a, a, an apartment that he got to live in, a room, a hotel room that he lived in there on site that they gave him as part of his package. And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I feel sorry for you. I'm just going to let you stay in my room. Uh, it's clean and you just stay there. I have to work the night shift and you'll be out in the morning before I ever get in there. So uh, since you don't have a place to stay, you can just stay in my room. And he gave him the key and he let them go to his room. 
that had his stuff in it. And they went down there and they had no, they had no choice about where they were going to stay. And so they went down and he made sure that they had everything that they needed. He took care of their every, every need, made sure that they were well taken care of and that they could get some food, even though it was late. And he just, he just really took care of them. And the next morning they checked out and they left. They thanked him so much. And then they went on their way. A few years passed, a couple of years passed and uh, maybe even three. And they contact, he's contacted by somebody who says, Hey, um, so-and-so wants to speak to you and he wants a business, uh, you know, luncheon with you. Uh, will you go meet him? And he's like, who, who is this? I don't know who this is, whatever. And he goes, he's with a hotel chain and he wants to talk to you about a possible job. He's like, um, oh, okay. Uh, I'll be glad to, to go have lunch with him or whatever. He gets there and it's that couple and they actually own, uh, the Waldorf hotel in New York city, the Waldorf Astoria. And at the time they had, were building that hotel in New York City. Um, they hadn't completed it, but they were building it with the intent of hiring him to manage it because they thought he had he had the best skills of anybody that they had ever met uh, in their lives in terms of hospitality, in terms of managing a hotel. And it was a large hotel that they were staying at. Um, and so they hired him as the manager of the most prestigious hotel in New York City. And he went to work there and he worked there the rest of his career. Now I tell you that story because he had a choice to make. He had the opportunity when they came in, he could have done anything. You know, I mean, he could have, there were all kinds of choices standing there staring him in the face. And the choice that he made was an unselfish one. It didn't benefit him at all. In fact, it, he had a risk. He risked letting two people he didn't know stay in his room and, um, and, you know, how that would look on his hotel. He could get in trouble for it because they're not supposed to put people in those rooms. And yet he was willing to do it because they had nowhere else to go in the middle of Philadelphia on a cold, dark night. He was willing to do that. So for us, we sit here and we go, okay, in, in situations, I have a choice. So um, in terms of uh, my spouse, think about how, how much this choice. Now, I told you a story about a dog, right? And, and the, how big and how many repercussions and consequences there were associated with having that dog. But let's talk about bigger fish to fry, right? Let's talk about some of these decisions that we make on a regular basis. And I wrote down 10 of them. But like choosing a spouse, how big a deal is choosing a spouse? And yet some people get married on a whim. Some people get married after one day of knowing each other. Some people run off to Vegas or whatever and they get married just right away. Jill and I, um, again, uh, I had known her less than a year when we got married. And so I'm one to talk about that. But in terms of did I pray and fast before I made that decision? Absolutely. Did I seek out wise counsel before that decision? Yes. I mean, all those things. And, and these are some of the things we need to talk about in terms of uh, how do we make these decisions. And you always hear that number one is prayer and fasting, right? So... Um, if I'm choosing a spouse, that's important. If I'm choosing where to live, what part of the country, what city to live in, um, I need to look at things like the level of crime, the schools. Um, I need to look at things like if it's uh, along the coast somewhere that has hurricanes or in the heart of Oklahoma that gets tornadoes or whether it's in Las Vegas where it gets to be 115 degrees in the summertime or higher and is called Sin City. Where I live is an important decision, the city that I live in. If I live in certain ones, there are, you know, cities like Chicago where people are killed on, regularly, murdered regularly. They have a huge, New Orleans, huge murder rate. Baltimore, huge. Those are, those are cities that have these enormous uh, murder rates. And, and they're supposed to be great because they have gun control. And that's, you know, another question altogether. But where I'm going to live, where I'm going to go to college, you know, am I going to go to the military? Am I going to go vocational? What school am I going to go to? Do they think like I think in terms of values and morals? Those are big questions. Do I, you know, when to have kids? How many kids to have? You know, if I have nine kids, there's going to be problems because I have nine kids. I'm going to have financial problems because I have nine kids. I mean, unless I'm a billionaire, um, there, there's going to be some issues with who's going to watch them and how am I going to get them here and if we go to a theme park, how am I going to look after nine kids and how am I going to feed them and get them to school and all those kind of things? Um, what kind of house I'm going to have? Because that means how much debt I'm going to have, what neighborhood I'm going to live in, and am I going to be comparing myself to the Joneses and all those kind of things? Um, what kind of car I'm going to drive? 
Um, my son came to me, my oldest son. He said, I'm thinking about buying a car. Here's the two cars I'm looking at. And I said, um, okay, those are great. I said, have you checked on how much the insurance is for each one? And he goes, yeah, I've kind of I've looked into that and they're similar. And I said, how about repair costs? Have you looked at that? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, how much is it to like change the oil on each one and that kind of stuff? And on one of the cars to change the oil was $99. And on the other one, it was uh, almost $300 to change the oil in that car. $300. I went, um, duh, here we go. I can tell you which one to buy at this point between the two you showed me, right? But sometimes we don't think about those things in terms of when we're buying, we just walk up on the lot and go, oh my goodness, there's the one for me. And we buy it and you know, there's sometimes there's some huge things about it, gas mileage and those kind of things that go into it. Where to work, what our vocation is going to be, um, whether we're gonna be a social worker or an air traffic controller or a cop or a firefighter or a first grade teacher. I say all those because they're high stress jobs but the first grade teacher one is that, you know, when Jill went to be, the very first year she went to work in school, she was a kindergarten teacher. And the first year she was sick every two weeks. She caught something every two weeks. She, was, she had something different all the time because she didn't have, you know, the, the, uh, her, her uh, antibodies weren't where they needed to be. And so she was sick a lot. And that's not something you think about when you go and you go, hey, I want to have an impact on children's lives. You don't think about, okay, I'm going to be sick some because this stuff runs through these schools rampantly um, when something new comes out. Um, and now I think she's probably the most immune to anything of any of us because she's had so many things at this point. Um, but choosing my vocation, choosing my friends, choosing my church, is that important? Okay, a girl I dated, and Jill hates this when I tell stories like this, but a girl I dated in high school moved to North Carolina. And so... Uh, after she moved about a month later, I decided my parents said they would drive me over there and I would get to see her and we would go for the weekend and all of us would be there, my mom and dad and everybody. And so we went over and on Sunday we went to the, this new church that they had chosen to go to and it was in a community, kind of like a Dell Webb kind of community. It was, uh, everything was there. You know, you had all your grocery stores, you had everything you needed, never had to leave the area or whatever. And I sat down and as we walked down the aisle of this uh, building, the building had glass all the way around it, and it was kind of near the country club kind of thing in this area, and it had plastic that ran down the middle aisle on the floor, kind of like your grandmother used to do to spare her carpet, and um, but it had that kind of stuff going down the middle, and I was like, what is this? This is cheap plastic stuff. What is it for? And so all these people came in, and they were all dressed like really bright colors and very, I was like, wow, there's a lot of you know fashion stuff going on here. All these people dressed like this. And they had this sign that was up front to the right of the choir. And so as the service is going on, that sign keeps flashing numbers. It keeps flashing like 113, 217, 343, 744. And it's these, it's these numbers. And I was like, is this, is this like bingo? What are they doing? I don't know what this is that they're doing. Why are they having these things? And I leaned over to this girl and I said, hey, well, what's the deal with the sign? And she goes, and, and I did notice that when that flashed, some people would get up and leave. And I was like, okay, maybe their kids are acting up in the nursery and that's a sign to tell them, go get your kid, we need your help. And that's not what it was. I said, what's the deal with the sign and, and all this? And she goes, oh, their, their tea times are ready and they're going to play golf. So they would sign up for a tea time and they would come to church up until the point of which their tea time was and then they would get up, it would flash, hey, your, your tea time is coming up. And then it was like a 15 minute notice so that they could get up and then they would all walk out, four of them at a time, and go play golf. And I went, I'm not sure that's the kind of church I wanna to go to, uh, is that we've catered to society so much that we're doing that. And so choosing a church is a, is a big deal. Choosing what movies to watch and what books to read, that's, that can be a big deal in terms of, of what they do to us, how they change us, and sometimes not for the good. Um, the music that we listen to, you know, there's a, a, a guy uh, that he and his girlfriend uh, lived on the East Coast. She had come there to go to college, and they were listening to some, you know, better best way I can describe it to you is kind of devil worship kind of music a little bit. And I mean, seriously, where it was like, you know, Satan, Satan, he's our guy, you know, that kind of music, but really, really hard. Um, and, and they listened to this music together and kind of started going to these concerts, following these bands, a couple of these bands around. And she was always complaining about her parents and how mean they were and awful to her growing up and everything. And so that guy then drove all the way across the United States, went to California and killed her family. Who does that? Who, who, who does something like that? 
And yet the music that went after they sat down, they started listening to the music that they've been listening to. And it was all like, you know, if someone, someone does you wrong, kill them, do away with them, shoot them, you know, this kind of stuff. And, and he had taken it to heart and it just kind of washed over him, filled him up with that kind of hate. And then he went and he, he took care of the parents and killed them. And so for us, we have to be careful about some of those kind of choices. All right. So let's talk about what not to do just to start with. Okay. So how do you make decisions? These are things you shouldn't do, right? We can't let ourselves get to the point where I, I call them just screw it moments, moments of desperation in our lives where we make just stupid, stupid decisions because we're like, I don't care at this point. I'm just going to do this, right? We can't let ourselves get down to a place like that, that rock bottom moments where we just, you know, where somebody says, you know, you're out of money. We should go rob a liquor store. We should go rob a convenience store. We should rob a bank or whatever it might be. And we go do something that makes things 10 times worse. You know, go hit that wasp nest with that broom. That's what you ought to do. And, and we're at such a point in our lives, we do those things um, because of we're at, we're at a moment of desperation. Another one is making choices based upon everybody else is doing it. Oh my goodness. If we make choices based on what everybody else is doing, we can really get ourselves into some really nasty places because the world chases after all kinds of stuff. Um, the third one is, uh, making decisions based upon what's easy. You know, I always talk about, cause I, I've experienced, you know, whether to, you're trying to lose weight, get in shape, you know, going to the gym, all those kind of things. We would much prefer to have a pill that made us get in shape because that's easy. And in the past, we've had several different kinds of programs out there, um, that were intended to do that, make it easy for us to lose weight that have called, caused serious health concerns. One that comes to my mind is FinFin, um, where people had just lasting negative health results because it, it was an idea of, hey, this is a good thing to do. You don't have to go lift weights. You don't have to worry about cardio. You don't have to worry about nutrition. You can just take this pill and it would help you to be able to do that. So we can't make decisions just based on what's easy because that'll always get us in trouble. And then the last one, we can't always make decisions selfishly. Every decision can't be for us. If, uh, you know, there are times where um, I'll, I'll say to, you know, Jill, Jill's very, very good about, I'll, we'll go, what, what do you want to eat tonight? And so she's always like, I'll go eat anything. I don't care. Let, I'll go anywhere you want to go. And I go, me too. I'm not, I'm, I'm not choosy. I'll go anywhere you want to go. And then she and Sila will go, let's go over here and eat. I'll go, no, 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 no. Let's not go there. No, no. And then they'll go, okay, let's go over here. And I'll go, no, 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 no. And then we end up eating hot wings and they're like, see, you did have a, you, you were selfishly wanting hot wings. So you were just trying to pretend to be unselfish, right? And so for us, we have to make decisions that are sometimes unselfish, much like the guy that let the people stay in his room uh, and, and became, you know, how that worked out for him. Um, we, we actually physically have to make decisions sometimes that don't benefit us at all. We, we literally have to do things that we don't get anything for it. Um, it just benefits the person that, uh, and, and I think of our kids, you know, there's a lot of times as parents and grandparents, we make decisions that don't benefit us at all and benefits our kids greatly. And they never even acknowledge it. They never even understand that it benefited them and not us. Uh, and how much of a sacrifice it was or whatever it may be, the hours that you work or the money you set aside or, you know, how you prayed and protected them, whatever it might be. Um, but those aren't easy. Those aren't, 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 and they're not, they're not selfish decisions. They're very unselfish decisions. All right. So let's add up a couple of things here, really, uh, as far as our action steps, you know, we talked about prayer and fasting, but let's finish up right here. So consult a mentor, Christian mentor. Find somebody that you can trust when some big decision is coming up and ask their opinion. And so if we look at Proverbs 12, 15, so let's look at that together in the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs. I'm losing the sword drill as always here. And it is uh, Proverbs 12, 15. Um, it says, The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Do we listen to advice? Are we willing to have somebody in our life that we trust? And then in addition to God, because I said prayer and fasting, we're trusting God, but it's kind of like we're looking for confirmation. We're just asking somebody who's wise, who has experience, 
may have made decisions, both good and bad, that they're trying to learn from and trying to express that to us. And we're supposed to listen to that advice. And it's something that we can use when making that decision. All right. So the next one would be that, after, you know, as we're praying and fasting, consulting them, that we should wait for a little bit. Now, waiting sometimes isn't in our wheelhouse because if a house is on the market and it's a hot market and we've decided we want this house and then we need to act now, we've got to go out, we've got to, right? That's what we talk ourselves into. It's the last car that's like this one in that color. I'd say, if I don't act right now, I've got to have it. And um, that doesn't benefit us either. And so look at Isaiah 40. And this is one that some of you have memorized through the years. Um, and it's a popular scripture that you see on artwork and everything else. But it says, um, even youths grow tired and weary. This is uh, Isaiah 40, and I'm at verse 30. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now that's the NIV, but the King James says, they that wait upon the Lord, W-A-I-T. And so I do believe that there's a period where we need to kind of meditate on that decision, think about it, and sometimes a good night's rest makes all the difference in the world uh, in terms of making that decision. But we're, we, we are called to wait. for, And I'm not talking about don't get frozen in place where it's six months, a year, or whatever, before you make a decision. I used to do that in terms of buying everything, and then stuff would be out of you know, it would be old and, and worn out and stuff like that. I would buy computers that were outdated because I'd waited so long and evaluated all the information. But the next one is do your research, do your homework. Look at Luke 14. And these are Jesus's words. Luke 14, um, verse 28. And it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king's about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So we're called to do research, called to do our homework, and, you know, we do our due diligence. We do everything we can. My friends, Randy and Leah, just sold their company. And I'm sure there was a process in there. It's been almost a year or more that the other company has been evaluating back and forth. And they've been evaluating that other company to make sure this was a good fit, uh, that this sale was going to be a good thing. And, and you do research on all the people, the employees, their, their customers, their equipment, what their sales were, their books, all that stuff to make a good decision. And then the last one is probably the most important. Does my decision or my choice violate God's commands? And that's something that we saw in the story that I shared tonight is trying to make sure that what I do, what I choose to do, lines up with God's will. And remember what I said on Sunday is if we pray and we, we feel like we hear a voice and that voice is telling you to do something that's opposite of what the Bible says in some place, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not that. That's not God speaking to you at that point. Um, sometimes the still small voice within me is that selfish voice that's going, yeah, that doesn't, that's not a good thing for you. What does that do for you? You know, that kind of thing. And so uh, making sure that you know God's word um, and that you've written it on your heart, that you're aware of God's commands, especially those, because when I was talking about the work example, I, those were the seven deadly sins that Catholics talk about. You know, the stuff uh, about gluttony and anger and sloth and greed uh, lust, envy, and pride. Those are all the things I was talking about. The choices that we make at work are all based on those things. And so any choice that we make should be in line with God's commands, His will, not, not against them. So, well, I'll stop there and I uh, hope that you have a great evening and um, God bless you and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris. All right, see you guys. Bye. Good night. Good night.